I think we we have something. I hope we. Oh, yeah. hello. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Tony Craig. He's the artist. <laughs> okay. And I must say, I, I have to apologize. Uh, to apologize, but I have to reject your remark that I know him the best. I think his wife knows him better than I. <laughs> oh no. You saw all these wonderful images, and I think it's quite a ride through many years and dec some decades of, of work that Tony has produced, and uh, you all know him well, I suppose, because he is an outstanding artist, and I, I must say a lifelong friend. We have cooperated occasionally, we have done exhibitions together, we have taught together at Dusseldorf Academy, when both of us were slightly younger. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, many years ago. 25 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> yeah, but things haven't changed very much, I would say. Uh, in the meantime, you are the director of that academy now, still, and uh, have done quite some things there. And I think, to begin with, uh, I would like to ask the artist to help us a bit to understand him better and to look into his history a bit. And, uh, Tony, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the family where you come from, this heritage of being an English artist born in Liverpool in 1949. Quite a young man, I would say, from my point of view. <laughs> born okay. 48. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, that's right. I was born in Liverpool in 1949, but I didn't live there. I was, I was there. It was, um, my father worked for the uh, Fleet Arrow, which is in the part of the British uh, military, which was responsible for servicing the aeroplanes that were on... Um, uh, aircraft carriers and um, he so when, when I was a kid we moved to a lot of different places and it was convenient for me to be born my mother had an aunt in Liverpool so she went there to have a child <laughs> <laughs> something like that and um, so but um, and I had these aunts remained there and I so my relationship to Liverpool is that I used to go there regularly to visit these two aunts uh, as a kid which I Nice memory of Liverpool. Uh, but we, uh, in fact, we lived everywhere. We lived in Not Lossiemouth in the north of Scotland and in Somerset, in Yeovil, in Bristol, in Brighton. Well, in Gans, uh, it's a very long list. I think I went to seven schools in all, so we moved around a lot. I have two younger brothers. And um, my, one of my grandfathers was a sea captain that was uh, sunk three times in the Second World War. Uh, and he couldn't, couldn't, they couldn't swim. Okay, sorry. He said, what's the use? If you get sunk in the middle of the Atlantic, it wouldn't help me if I could swim. So that was... And, um, and the other was a, a farmer in, 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 in Sussex, uh, my, my father's... Um, my grandfather's... On my father's side. So, and... Um, yeah, out of this mixture, maybe going to different schools and always having to be in different... does sort of probably, uh, as you will notice during the course of the evening, make you into somewhat un... Uh, calm person, always having to sort of identify with another group of people, whatever. And um, during growing up, I mean, mom, I said going to see my aunts in Liverpool, but with long summer stays on the farm, uh, my grandfather's farm, uh, were very meaningful to me and uh, were very, very close in the Sussex uh, nature. And they gave me a, maybe that was something that was very, I, 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 I that was very, maybe used later on in my work or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, if that's what we're looking for, and um, and and I and I very readily sort of ended up sort of collecting stuff like mainly fossils and and rocks, and that was oh, really well, one of the very first things I was interested in was like collecting, uh, yeah, and it was a big an ambition to um, to actually be a, to be a geologist for a while. Okay, and did you did you show any of that? Did you make shows for that? Did you put them together and show them to people? Like <laughs> making them ever <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> before you did this. Yeah. No, I didn't. No, it was just just a collection. So how from there did you get mm -hmm. into the arts then? Finally, I mean, this well, is, yeah. sounds like a wonderful childhood. Besides everything that is including traveling a lot and so, but being with a grandfather and working on a farm and uh, having all these opportunities is something, and we may find him back later on there on some traces. <laughs> but how did you get into the arts? Um, well, I actually went, uh, if you keep changing school a lot, one of the things you can, only things you can follow really are the maths and the science syllabuses, because they're pretty constant everywhere you go. And the arts and the humanities tend to be have different syllabuses. So 
at the end of my school education, it was really all I had left was uh, uh, so and I and I thought I I had the opportunity to work in a in a research uh, establishment called the Natural Rubber Producers Research Association <laughs> in Welling Garden City, and they did a very, very interesting job. They were financed by the Malayan government. Uh, at that time, the, their main export was natural rubber, caoutchouc, and um, it was under great competition with petrol, uh, synthetic rubbers, so, which is which in some ways is superior to um, to natural rubber, which is polyisoprene and has a weak double bond and it cracks. You know, it's typical ozone cracking, and that's really all we did in this laboratory was look for ways of stopping uh, uh, polyisoprenes breaking up in front. So. And I had this idea of, uh, you know, sort of a life in science and um, I ended up in a very smelly laboratory with a lot of old men and there, were no, there wasn't the men that were smelly, it was the, the chemicals were very... <laughs> and, it was, uh, and, um, you, um, and basically, you, you know, science, you think it's 360 degrees, you're going to discover something, you suddenly sort of, like every day, that, that, that margin of what you're actually looking at, it gets narrower and narrower and I was looking for a an antioxidant for polyisoprene. And that was, that was, and that was a very low, I mean, just a laboratory system, a very low level laboratory system that if, you, if I got it together, I should have done a degree or something in, in, um, in biochemistry. And the experiments were so long and uh, tedious, and I was the one that was left to sit there in the evening and at the weekends and note all the things. And uh, there weren't computers in this time, which was 1968, 69. And, uh, I just started to draw, and, I, I, and after a while, and after a couple of weeks or months of uh, drawing, um, I thought it was much more interesting drawing. I was, became much more absorbed with that, to the detriments of some of the experiments, I have to say. <laughs> um, uh, and um, at to some point, somebody said, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you go to art school? And it was a completely new idea to do that. I never, never really hadn't thought of it at all. And, uh, and I thought, well, a year away from this place wouldn't be too bad. And uh, so I applied for a, 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 into an art school. I had to apply in the west of England because my parents had moved to the west of England then. And um, I, I got a place and I went to Gloucestershire School of Art. Yeah, that's what we read. But you didn't finish there. You went on and you went to other schools. Yeah, it was like... And you moved up. I mean, in a way, it was a kind well, of strategic up. advancement, right? Do you think so? <laughs> yeah, it seems to me. I'm not seeing I mean. that. <laughs> I'm not being aware of that advancement, but I mean, I did get older. And now in England, I mean, like in everywhere else, you go to art school and you have one year of general studies. And this was a very, uh, one would say, academic, very classical study of of art where you learn to draw and paint and, and make sculpture and Still, ceramics yeah, and yeah, all those, yeah, mm -hmm. printing and everything. You do all these things. And it, and, um, and it was very, yeah, it's very instructive and very good. And, um, I wanted to draw, and I thought painting. I got into painting, so I thought you know the next step would be to paint. And uh, but we were obliged. We were obliged to do different things and you know, make prints and whatever else. And, and then they, one day they said, oh, you know, next week, um, next week you're going to make sculpture. <laughs> what, what, what a terrible idea! I thought I wasn't at all keen on that. And so on Monday morning at nine o'clock, and you have to sign in in English art schools at that time, which I tried to introduce in the Dusseldorf Academy, but <laughs> <laughs> did it work? Nobody's going to take that one. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And um, then, uh, and you, we were introduced. We were taken to this rather sort of broom cupboard full of old materials and stuff, and told to take something out and get on with this thing. And <laughs> and I was exasperated anyway, but we did it and. And I think it was a, that was, I would say, if there's been a key, key experience, I mean, it was really doing that, because even within the first few hours of, sort of playing with, moving this material around, I, did, I felt it was very remarkable that every time you take a bit of material and you just you move it around, change its shape or whatever, you actually have different associations or different ideas or even yeah. at times different emotions about it. And I, I was fascinated, so I, I really... Thought, oh, well, that's great, you know, and I and I and I went back and um, well, I was very happy after three weeks that I could go back and and do some painting again, but I so it didn't really 
changed my life. But uh, and where was that? That was in Wimbledon. Uh, uh, no, no, that was in, in that was in Gloucestershire during my still in Gloucestershire. what we call the foundation year. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I applied, as you were encouraged in British art schools, then they have in, in Britain a remarkable art school system, which is combined with, uh, with design and other, you know, in one, I think they have 18 different um, uh, subjects you can study in art schools, and uh, probably there are more today, because today, oh, yes. what people think as art is much bigger than it was then, and unfortunately. And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, and so they, um, and not all art schools had all subjects. So I and I applied to go to Wimbledon School of Art for painting course, and then I got and I went there. And so that was the next three years painting, and uh, I should have been on a painting course. Um, but what I did, I, I, for some reason, I, I, that summer between one academy and the other, I worked in a foundry, and it was a fantastic place to work. It was an enormous, big, black industrial hall, and it was a night job. And um, there were a lot of West Indian guys there, and the boss was an Indian. And uh, we were really, it was a uh, very tough job, pouring metal out. I mean, I had a game just pulling the clinker away and clean, keeping the place tidy. But this enormous big black ho uh, hole, and on one side you had a sort of group of men making molds and sand behind the two big furnaces full of producing, sort of melting the metal and the moulds coming in front of you and two guys pouring the stuff into the moulds and the moulds moving down this enormous black hall um, <clears throat> in a kind of serpentine designed to sort of cool, let the moulds cool down. And then at some point, hours later, they, they, f they fell into the ground. They went on to a kind of shaker, rutler, and the, the, all of the cast elements were put up, stacked up in, on one side and an enormous cone of black sand started to sort of develop on the other side. And so, and it was really, I thought sculpture, right? it was so dynamic and fantastic. Absolutely. And yeah. other than having to go into the shower in the morning with all these big we uh, West Indian guys, and the, <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> every morning the same story. Yeah. And anyway, so... Uh, um, so that's early 70s. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then I went to, went to started the course in Wimbledon, and that was... Um, and it was, a, it was a small paint studio with 32 people with painting behind easels. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I've had, it's a tough, been a tough job. And I just had to dip kind like of Conrad energy. Clapic at the Dusseldorf Academy. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> easels, small paintings. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Ah, can't remember. And um, so I started to make something else. And I started uh, making stuff with very simple materials, picking stuff up and... and, and Tying knots and string and whatever and whatever and so yeah, and that's what we have seen here. First example. Yeah, they're the beginnings of that, were those yeah. works. Yeah, putting Whereas things more or less together, or working mm. at the beach. Yeah, more or less Drawing like an agent. Yes. and the mm. sea coming in and washing it away. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And then they send me. They said, well, "This isn't painting, Craig. You have to go down and talk to the sculptors." So I went down to the sculptors, and they said, "No, no this isn't sculpture." <laughs> <laughs> so they send me back. They send me back to the to the painters. So I was. So I have a degree in painting. I didn't do it. Well. Never never made a painting. But there you go. Ah, oh, that's a hidden reality. That's yes. really <laughs> if any of you owns a painting from <laughs> by, uh, from the early times, it would be interesting to see it. Yeah. You. Okay. I'll send you them. So then, Royal College. How did you get there? Um, yes. And I, in Britain, then at the time, there, there were a lot of. Uh, Academy, uh, colleges, art schools that, that, that offered uh, something what we call them BA. It was called the Diploma of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. At that time, I think I have the first year where I actually got a BA for art. And out of that, um, that was the qualification in those years, to be honest. I mean, the early 60s, Absolutely. 70s, BA was, and MA was, was a sort of advanced step up. And uh, I know today, I mean, you're not qualified until you've got a BA, you know, so an MA. So, um, and there were very few few uh, MAs being offered in Britain. There were there were there were there was in the in the Royal College there was some, in the Royal Academy there were a couple, in Slade there was something, and I think in Reading there was two two places two mm -hmm. two, and I applied to uh, only to the Royal College, and I was amazed that uh, they took me, but um, one of two people they took that year, and I started there, and then it was serious. Serious sculpture with Bernard Meadows, an ex-assistant of um, a very good sculptor, an assistant of uh, Henry Moore, a real 
um, brood of a guy that used to come around and sort of want to sort of sort of get on with the work, and you weren't here at this time, and she was a real bully and, and well, uh, working ethic. And I was in a room with a guy that was studying in St Martin's School of Art, and he'd been on the other side of the camp, uh, which is with the Anthony Caro people. So he used to come in early in the morning with his with his sort of aluminium box of sandwiches and put them in his spin in his in his locker. And then he'd put down his welding mask and he'd mask like a maniac or weld all the, all day long. And, then, and at 10 o'clock he'd stop and he'd get his thermos flask out and get any sand. <laughs> so it could have been in Dagenham's <laughs> Ford Motors. Anyway, so that was the, you know, and I just, yeah, I didn't understand that. But anyway, so it was a good place to be. It was, it was in the middle of London on, on, uh, on Queensgate with, and I shared, which was fantastic. Our, the Royal College uh, Sculpture School at that time shared the yard with the with the Geological Museum and the Natural History Museum, and and we were allowed to just walk into the museums at any time, and uh, they they had a ca can canteens, cafeterias, and we we could eat in those cafeterias, and um, so it was just a fantastic uh, three years. And any interesting people? I mean, just trying to understand this this time there was this heavy impact of classical sculpture in British sculpture and were there any changes because I remember in Germany for example there was a big discussion go to academy but don't learn anything of all these traditional things don't go and learn anatomy don't go and draw don't do that don't do that just invent and whatsoever what was the reality in, in Britain where you had Henry Moore hanging like uh, a big thing above you all mm. Okay, I mean, um, I think in Britain, there, I mean, the first things that... Uh, Henry Moore was omnipresent. I mean, he was... Godfather. Yeah, I mean, he was a, he's really is a great artist. I mean, as a student... You loathed him. I mean, you couldn't see any more Henry Moore, and sometimes, even today, I think, why am I here in some, <laughs> some, some Adelaide or something? There are two Henry Moores here in the park. Everywhere you go, it's like sort of uh, a sort of cultural flagship, and I think uh, probably to his detriment... Uh, to his reputation, but um, I learned to love his work, and I, I know he's a great artist. Um, maybe I take very quickly that that experience. I, I did an exhibition in Toronto many in the seventies, and um, uh, while I was waiting, I'd installed my exhibition, and I walked around the city and walked into the into the museum completely innocently, and to just walk into this amazing place with, with eighteen original Henry Moore um, plasters. And, it, and I thought, Jesus, the guy's everywhere. And I, I, didn't re <laughs> I didn't realize that this was his big thing that he'd given to the city of Toronto. I mean, I was, wasn't. And, uh, and just seeing these, these uh, very immediate, and they were fantastic. And, uh, and I was very impressed by that and uh, respected him afterwards. But so Henry Moore was there. There was already, in the 60s, a, a movement against Henry Moore. Anthony Caro yeah. was his assistant, and he, he, got, he wanted to use abstract sculpture and get away from More figuration. Also in a way. So there was a lot of, there was mm -hmm. a real dynamic already in that generation. But by the time, especially St. Martin's was a big place for, for uh, at that, that time, and um, uh, there were two things going. One was the new generation of artists like Gilbert and George and Richard Long and, and, and Bruce McLean all coming up. And they were really, they were maybe the German equivalent. The problem in Germany is a completely different one. It wasn't necessarily, in Britain didn't have that need to discover a new culture in the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't the same, there hadn't been the same trauma, historical trauma. There had been one, but it was of a different nature. Mm -hmm. And so they, they weren't looking for new images in, in the same way that maybe in German, that made German art so radical in, uh, in the 60s. But they were very uh, in, in, revolutionary in terms of British culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Gilbert and George, who I met a couple, a couple of weeks ago, still, after all these years, 50, 40 years of still being Gilbert and George, uh, as, as a monumental work, I and I uh, have to say. And, um, so there were these new gener generations already in Britain of sculptors, all kind of already vi vying with, that, with each other and very competitive. And at the same time, of course, enormous influence from the United States. So you're already getting uh, a lot of um, 
influence from Smith and then the minimalists. And then it was Judd and, and Andre and whatever. And so when I started at the Royal, well, in, even though I was in Wimbledon, there were exhibitions of Carl Andre in the Listen Gallery. Mm -hmm. And I went there as a 21 year, 20 year old, and I just thought, this is incredible. I couldn't, at that time, I was so impressed by it because it, it wasn't loaded with sort of unwanted imagery. It suddenly, minimal art had the great quality that it kind of changed the relationship between the art object and the spectator because it wasn't art that was trying to tell you a story or impress you. It was suddenly, minimal art turns the onus back on the viewer to mm -hmm. see what's inside himself and what he can invent in looking at the work. And it was very strong, very meaningful. So for a while, I was very heavily, uh, as, a, as a young, as a student, influenced by conceptual and minimal art. Mm -hmm. And so that early work was 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 well was informed by by those by those works, until the point that I get to be sort of a few years, a couple of years on, and you think, well, you know, but I'm, this is a different generation. Uh, I'm not interested in straight lines and flat things. It's not doesn't suit me at all. Yeah. And uh, and started and I even mm -hmm. start to see minimalism as a as a kind of imperial cultural imperialism in a, in a sense you know with straight lines and flat edges taking re taking the culture away from everybody you know yeah. there would be no complicated natural houses or anything because it was too simple. But your work in that time it comes to us mainly through photographs. I have really seen pieces from these years. You mm. were, so you were yeah. reacting to certain things. You were trying to find your own ways, but it was very little bound to actually producing physical things, or? No, I mean, I mean, you have to also think, I mean, in that time in early, late 60s, early 70s, I mean, maybe things have changed a lot over the last 40 years, but it is the fact, when you went to art school, I mean, my parents were furious. I mean, everyone said, why the hell go to art school? I mean, what, what you never earn any money. And you, and you went to art school, you, I mean, you knew there would be no chance of becoming a, a well-known artist and, uh, and, and nobody thought they'd get a job at all. Mm -hmm. But it was just something, for whatever uh, personal ideal reasons, mm -hmm. uh, you, you wanted to do it. And uh, like maybe some people study philosophy and other things, and it's an ideal thing. And then um, maybe things have, and I think that's a pity today that's changed because it's kind of, for many, Young people, it's a career option in a sense. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's heavy, so and more that's, difficult. That's changed, but um, at the time, so there was no. It was just for yourself, and so it didn't have to be kept. You know. And but how did that switch happen into a more professional career that started in the middle of the seventies or so? You went <coughs> away from England. You went to France to teach. When were your first trips to the U.S. and, and whatsoever? That's interesting too. Okay. Get us, get you out of uh, academy now. Okay. Well, I mean, okay, that's good. Uh, good for me. No, I was in those, in those early years, in those early years, I already met, had friends like Richard Long and, and other people, mm -hmm. and uh, I made an, the acquaintance of Nicholas Loggs there from the Listen Gallery, and he was the first person that showed serious interest in my work, and uh, and and for me very nicely because he went to a small exhibition in a in a, in a, in a library in Oxford University and didn't know who the hell I was and, and whatever, and he just called me up and said he'd like to come by. And I said, well, I'm in the Royal College. Yeah. And so he, actually in 1975, he took me to, to do, into the United States to do a, a, a group show. One has to say in the United, there was no real interest in European art in the United States at that time, contemporary art at least. And, um, uh, and there was a man called Julian Preto on Hudson Street, and he, he, had, he, had, he, he lent his rather big space uh, to um, show uh, the artists of Conrad Fisher and the Listen Gallery and art and projects from Amsterdam. And so he showed in Spironi. So all of these European galleries had something, a lot of them had their first showing in the United States under the, in this uh, Hudson Street. So, and it, for me, it was my big adventure. I mean, as a young person, British person, as I said, my, my family is what they call lower middle class, which is probably the poorest of all classes in Britain. And uh, <laughs> so I'd never had any money and I'd never traveled anywhere. And it was a big, big kind of adventure to go there. And I arrived uh, in the United States and, uh, on, and, it, and it was very, I was so excited to go there. But when I got there, it was minus 30 degrees. And it, <laughs> it, was, it was so cold that there were no cars on the road. It was absolutely in the morning. And I arrived and got, you know, get, get out of the, airport and asked the guy, you know, you say, 
You take me to New You're going to New York. This is what do you think I'm doing here, buddy? Like, <laughs> so you get in a taxi, you get to New York for the first time, the whole excitement that I'm sure most of you have had, and uh, couldn't sleep, jet lag and all these phenomena I wasn't at all used to. So I got up, went out onto the street at 5 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> minus 30 degrees, and after a while I read I got these cheap English plastic clothes on, and my, <laughs> <laughs> and my face began to freeze. I couldn't... Uh, and I oh, saw, you had a smile on, or? There was a frozen smile. Okay, well, and I, and I saw a sign in the distance, 100 yards away, it said, Diner. I thought, it's like a dream. So I just managed <laughs> to get in there before my brain froze. And, well, and it was like a sort of American dream, you know, sort of big aluminium bar and all these white, uh, all these uh, red chairs, stools you sit on. And I, I walked in, the guy said, hi, buddy, what do you want? And I said, do you serve breakfast? Well, this is a diner, man. Of course we serve breakfast. I thought, oh, okay, so I, bre I said, I have breakfast. I said, what do you want? So there was, I, have, I said, would you use bacon and eggs? I said, yeah, of course we have bacon and eggs. I said, so what kind of bacon do you want? I said, what kind of bacon do you want? I said, yeah, what do you got? He said, we well, got green bacon, smoked bacon. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so I'll take green bacon, you know, whatever it is. That's kind of difference. Yes. And he said, what kind of eggs? And I said, kind of eggs? Oh, yeah, scrambled, sunny side up, easy over, all these I think it's fantastic. This is the United States for me. I thought, this, <laughs> all these choices, you know. What kind of potatoes? Like home fries, French fries, hash brownies. You know? And I just, I thought, I finally ordered my breakfast, and I was just beginning to relax. I said, what do you want to drink? Oh, oh, what do you got? The stupid question, what do you want? <laughs> I said, hey, what do you got? And he says, oh, uh, we got Coca-Cola, coffee, tea. And I, he said, and I said, well, I have a tea. And he said, what kind of tea? <laughs> said, no, 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 no. I said, what kind of tea do you have? He said, we got Indian tea, Chinese, Ceylon tea, Darjeeling, Gritting, Earl Grey breakfast, uh, Irish breakfast tea. And I said, Irish breakfast tea. And he turns around and says, one tea. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, the Americans do have humour. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> despite okay. their uh, television programs. Was it, was it there you where you had Sorry? your exhibition? Was it that place where you had your show? <laughs> yeah, it was very, it was very near there. Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay. Yeah. And that was very exciting. I met people, people I've admired, like Don Judd and whatever. And uh, yeah, they uh, were the big that heroes. Put, that I mean, put me everybody off. went there because the big heroes were sitting in the U.S. New York was yeah. a major city at that. That's time. That's right. And, you, and a lot of Europe, Daniel Buren and and and. Uh, a lot of European artists were, were, were going there. And, yeah, you know, absolutely. So, but then I, uh, out of that, I, had, I was invited by the ministry, cultural ministry in France to, to work for um, a year in France, in an art school in Metz, Le Col de Beaux-Arts de Metz, mm -hmm. and, uh, which was a big, I said, you know, but it's very nice of you, I don't know why. And I, I was supposed to write a report about, the French had a vague idea of, of kind of emulating the British art school system whereby, and I was supposed to write comments and whatever about that. And uh, so, and the only thing, it was a provincial art school and the, and the, and the director really didn't want me there. And so he, I was put there by the ministry and he thought I was some kind of spy. And he, um, so was, he took me into a class of uh, some, like 30 students and they're all sitting there with, with the gas beton, uh, with the, uh, and they were cutting, and they had an owl at the front of them an owl. A real one? No, a stuffed, stuffed. Full, a stuffed, stuffed owl. And okay. they, were, they were chipping so out an owl in gas beton. And, I, <laughs> and, I, and he just said, you know, this is, this is, your, uh, this is your new teacher. Head He's English. <laughs> and these are your students. They're French. <laughs> and then and he, went, he went to the door and he left me on my own <laughs> for a year. With his <laughs> Et en français? Oh, uh, no. I had to learn <laughs> French <laughs> very rapidly. He speaks very good French. Yeah. Shall we switch to us? Yes. Est-ce qu'on va continuer en français maintenant? Si vous voulez. Bien sûr. Si on préfère. Comme tu veux. <laughs> so that's France. It must have been yeah, a no, nice big, no, it was, no, it was fantastic because it's the first time I, I actually have been abroad for a long time, out, out of Britain for a while, and you see, I mean, like we all know, you go somewhere and suddenly you, you grow up with all these values and you think this is, you know, I mean, I couldn't, I was surprised to get to France since I found out that the food was also quite good. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, weather wasn't good, but the food. And uh, so, 
and it, and it, it changed your values. And I, because it was Mets, and I did a lot of bicycling in that time. I used to do long tours, and so I used to quite regularly cycle across the, the, the into the into Germany, into the German world. So that was so, my first view of Germany was actually from the from from a bicycle, mm -hmm. and uh, I had uh, I'd met my at the time my girlfriend. We got married later, and she was from Wuppertal. And after being here for a few times, after, after um, uh, the time in, in, in France, uh, she was, still had to do her one-year study uh, in Bonn, and, uh, so, or, and teaching in, in, uh, practical, in uh, pra teaching practice in, in Essen. Mm -hmm. So I moved to, we lived to live to, to Wuppertal. Ever since he's in Wuppertal, and he's yes. the most famous British artist, artist living in Wuppertal. The most famous British artist in Wuppertal, yes, Absolutely. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just very ambitious. Absolutely, and you made it. I mean, it's just uh, people have yeah. competitions in quoting you a German artist or a Wuppertalian artist, or Wupp <laughs> even thinking about changing the name of Wuppertal into Wapper Valley. Uh, uh, no, none of in that English, they call it W Upper Valley. That's w Upper yeah. Valley. Okay, yeah. this is a nice misunderstanding. A little complicated. Yeah. 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 So and uh, so but I there, moved there. I originally there is, a, in a way, there was a little break because it, you kind of, kind of went into a kind of little, uh, how, however you call that, a little quiet time. And after two years, you came out with incredible things. Yeah, for me, it wasn't quite. I mean, I, I came to another country. I, I couldn't speak German. I had to learn German. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I, I mean, I wasn't sure. The idea was only to stay for a year, actually. And um, <laughs> so that went wrong. The sabbatical went and, uh, a bit longer. Then. Sorry? Sabbatical went a bit longer. Yes, a little bit, yeah. And um, then uh, I, just by chance, was offered a job, uh, a small job in the academy in Dusseldorf, where we met. Yeah? Absolutely. And, and uh, a couple of years jobs, later. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then, um, but I didn't. Oh, I I found it very easy to come to coming to Germany. In, in difference from coming to being in Britain, I, it was very easy to find a studio. It was very cheap to live there, and I got a. I needed some money, so I, I you know, the, what I could read in the newspaper, I saw something Marlin, and I thought, oh, painting. Oh, I can paint. So I found it was a, it was a sign painting uh, uh, factory. So I, I painted signs for a while in a, mm -hmm. in Barman in in Wuppertal. And then I got the job, this job in uh, in, uh, in the academy uh, because of Norbert Cricker, basically, who was a very generous and crazy guy. And then um, the then director of he was the director, the sculptor, of the, uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, really great sculptor. And then after that, I uh, went to uh, I was invited by Harold Seaman to be in a power tour. And there were, at the end of the seventies, there were a lot of exhibitions of what they call survey exhibitions. Um, where they were looking for a new, after this sort of conceptual generation, they were looking for a new, for new, something new to happen. And that was very different. I mean, as things always are, uh, it wasn't sculpture that happened, it was painting you know, in the end. So I was in the early 80s involved in a lot of exhibitions where I was basically one of the only sculptors in the, of that new generation, you know, and there were, but so there were, there were the Italians, Cookie Kia, uh, uh, Clementi and Vidi really, uh, or their Paladino, and then Germans like Immendorf and Lupert and Peng. Yeah. And, and it was a sort of was the Moritz boys here, not too far away. Uh, this is a real definition. I know it's an old hack, but I mean, you know, to really find out the de how to define sculpture is what you fall over when you step back to look at the painting. I mean, <laughs> and it, and it <laughs> never, I mean, never was truer in those but, years. But you, you couldn't, you couldn't say that really uh, about your first works there, you know, because the addition of found pieces of plastic material. You were really famous for these pieces, the ad additions of things that you had collected strolling along the river banks. Yeah, in no, the Germany first, the first plastic works were a little bit conceptual. I collected them over a very long period walking around Wuppertal and, oh, here's a bit of plastic. And so it was like a long, a day's walking just to get a few bits of plastic. And uh, so they, it was hard work. And then one day I went down, I was on a bicycle, went down to the Rhine, and you find the Rhine at that time, this swim, it was a big, colourful line of plastic all the way down the Rhine. I think, well, <laughs> could make some bigger works now. Yeah. So. That's the wealth of uh, the Rhine area. Yeah. <laughs> Rhine gold. <laughs> yeah. gold to a rather yeah, yeah. plastic line. No, and that was, that was really, a, 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 in a way, a, a, it didn't affect my work, but it was a very good, 
I mean, a very fortuitous start for me to. Yeah. You know. But I find it interesting. I mean, he's a wonderful storyteller, and we could easily fill like <laughs> I don't know a series think, of evenings here. I, I don't know how long have we. We have to ask our headmaster. We keep, keep going. We keep, we keep on going. <laughs> Nobody asleep. But the interesting thing is, Tony Craig is actually someone who, in his work, made very decisive mm -hmm. changes uh, in the way of his production. We have been talking about the plastic works here, these addition things, and suddenly he decided and rediscovered things that he had seen, you remember, long ago in this foundry, for example. He went into traditional materials that most people at that time in the young discussion would completely uh, object, like bronze, glass, what wood and whatsoever, you went into a completely different way of producing things. You changed your attitude towards sculpture, which is then something that you, if you walk back without looking, fall over. Yeah, some, <laughs> something that suddenly appeared three-dimensional in a much yeah, I'm, more I'm not sure really. Way, such a, yeah, I, I can see why and can often ask about that, but it's, in, it's not such a radical change and from my okay. point of view. I mean, I, I, it may be not accurate, but I mean, I am a real materialist. I mean, I, I, do, I believe everything is material, or it's phenomena. Even, uh, a lot of people don't like to hear it, even intelligence and emotions are, uh, in a sense, explainable in terms of, uh, of, of material changes, whatever, neurology, hormones, whatever you want to call them. And they're complicated, but they are, they are it is distinguishable and it's followable. So it makes me believe that everything is material. And even everything we have in our heads has come from the outside world. I mean, we, everything, we, every, we have a beauty, we're born with this very complicated organ, brain, but everything, it has to be informed. We, and we're, immediately we are there. Our eyes and our ears and our, our touch and everything absorb material from the data, from the, mater, from, from the material world. And we look for certain... Uh, uh, I, uh, characters, characteristics and properties of the material world to actually form terms, to form language, and so we can think. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not even, it's very, very complicated, but it's not like it's sure. a mystery. mystery. It, it works, it's, 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 and so, in a sense, everything we have in our head has come from outside. And that is why what is outside of us is very important. You know, I mean, so if you, and we live in, obviously, nature is the biggest source of, of material. It's the biggest source of, of, of properties that we can use in our language and our thoughts. So we have something like the sun or, the, or water or fire. We have an enormous amount of associative language that uh, that's our, that's, it's not just language, philosophy, metaphors. It's also emotions that uh, 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 brought about by these terms. And so that's... Uh, but for a lot of things that we make, I mean, around this, I mean, we make a lot of stuff that doesn't mean anything at all, you know. So, I mean, and I think that's what sculpture really does. Sculpture, and or art generally, makes images and provides language that does not exist in nature and does not exist in our everyday world. And in so, the everyday material world. In the everyday yes. material world. And, and, and in terms of looking, so that, that basically what I'm saying is that every piece of material, nothing is un unimportant. Yeah. Everything is meaningful. And that was a big surprise, I must say. When we did in the early, in the, in the 80s, did a show in Dusseldorf, was in the 80s, I yes, think. Yeah. And suddenly you saw in an exhibition like this in a museum, you see suddenly an, an eyeglass, an eye bath. You know, you all remember these things that we used to clean our eyes or so yeah. when we had a problem. And suddenly you see it like, three quarters of a meter high, standing there as a majestic thing, suddenly mm. it becomes something different. Or you see tiny toys with uh, sweet stuff in, inside that kids would use to suckle on, you know, uh, and to have some joy, and suddenly you see it as a real, as a real event, a three-dimensional event, very early uh, But a lot of those things, uh, a lot of those things, you see, that's the relationship between the small plastic things. Yo. The plastic works were very simple had a nice triangular feeling. It was material. Absolutely. They made an image. And, and uh, uh, there was a sense of an object. 
So and, there, were, there was the, ob the individual things, was object, material, and image. Yeah, and suddenly and went, they, were facing, you, they were facing you as a kind of figure yeah. that was standing there, almost like a person, because the size that I had gotten into suddenly created something else, you know. Yeah. Before they, it was just something to throw away, it was tiny and wasn't, wasn't I mean, it was maybe you, good to be used in a, in a found object piece or whatsoever, yeah. but suddenly it became something on its but own. But I think that's what I'm trying to say is, is that yeah. those, those works of found materials are what informed the later work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that was the source. They act like a sort of, if you like, a dictionary or an alphabet of, of forms and materials. And even looking at them, even, uh, even more recent work is about you know, using the geometries that are in those, in, in, in manufacture. Look here, there's a bunch of circles. It's just a, a circular object, isn't it? Just extended in space. So very, very simple geometries because of the cheapness of our manufacturing system. Yeah, I apologize for it. jumping back before because I just wanted to, to make clear that there is a kind of continuous development oh, yeah, in your work well. that I see because... The, I'm still there. Tony is a kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. but you have, a, you have a history and it's sometimes you're jumping, you know, over 30 years like it's a moment only and I just wanted to, to make clear to us all here that there is a continuous work of, of yours concerning reality found materials, uh, surfaces, um, structures that you change when you alter surfaces of glass in mistreating or treating it with sand and, and whatsoever, when you suddenly have wonderful uh, ameublements, interiors, uh, rooms created and suddenly you have lots of hooks brought in and everything looks like a shimmer of a white shimmer uh, kind of covered uh, or covering <coughs> all these materials. That are all steps in your development. And now, in these days, you're producing things that come from imagination, that come from, it is a kind of uh, inventory system that you have created ever since. And it's like, without even breathing, there is a quite uh, a real velocity in these things, how you produce Yeah, but I think and that's the way, I mean, the material the world is like that. Okay. I mean, we don't know, I mean, we have physics, I don't want to be scientific about it, but I mean, the material does develop. I mean, it develops from atomic explosions, from nuclear from energy forms, small nuclear particles to atoms to molecules, organic molecules, living molecules, intelligent molecules to things made by intelligent molecules. So there's an, there is already a, 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 and I think that if you work, I mean, the material, you don't, I don't, often don't feel I'm, how, how much I'm involved. I mean, I, I think just being an agent, like in the early works, just being an agent with the material. And I find myself being pushed along anyway in, in the making of it. I don't plan this, most of it. It's just, it just, it, I, I finished the work and I just, it's inevitable and, and one, I'm obliged to just do, to make the next, the next step in it. And, and, and part of the idea of the surface, I mean, we see the world, sure. thank the light that touches the surface of everything, you know, only by surfaces. We, we don't have ray, you know, X-ray vision. I mean, we see, so our, our vision is just due to reflecting, reflective light of surfaces. But I believe we have a kind of <clears throat> deeper psychological pressure in our minds to look beyond the surface. Yep. We always want to know what's behind. You know, we look at each other, you know, I mean, and so we read the, the, the subtleties of form in the face or whatever, but really we want to know what's behind that face. Or we see people's clothes, but it would be quite interesting to find out. Well, you bet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> find out what's going on underneath. Or you see small children walking and you see them touching the ground more than adults because we're so confident we're not going to fall through the floor. But children are not so sure about that. They touch with their feet to find out where they're walking. And mm. so we have, and so, um, and I think all, even historically sculpture is about that. Even if you see ancient sculpture, you see figures of Greek, uh, Greek or Roman sculpture, they show muscles and hair and say, so what are they doing? It's not clever to show, make muscles and hair and things in stone. I mean, the, what they're really doing is showing energy. It's showing, it's, and that's all being, uh, being alive is about it, all the time. We're expending an enormous amount of energy keeping our bodies upright. The minute we give up, we lay down. If we really give up, we lay down. And it takes a very short time until our material substance just gets absorbed by gravitation into the grave, into gravity. 
And, and that's what human existence is about, is actually like, is this kind of energy, these energies, whether it's, a, whether it's a chair, a human, or a building, or whatever it is, that all the things is just to, oh, the energy we need to overcome gravity. That's, that's what we're doing. And so this idea, the idea of a figure, you're, you're actually just giving, sign. even in classical figures, you're seeing energy uh, of certain kinds, not just muscular energy, but also fertile energy and intellectual energy and moral energies and other things. <laughs> and, and Henry Moore is not different. All these bulges and recesses and things, all he's doing, he's, he's, he's giving a kind of energetic picture of, of, of the world. And I think that's more or less about everything we... we that's, that's Tony, you have such a lot of... Um, you have mentioned such a lot of things and touched such a lot of... a variety of things, philosophical things, science in many, in many fields. I mean, could you give us maybe in a, in, in a sentence more or less the relation between science and art? What is the major difference? What is the advantage of doing art and not being a scientist researching energy in different fields or whatsoever? That's an interesting question perhaps for the public. And a very difficult question, of course, but I mean, science as we understand it, you know, we call it in German like Wissenschaft, it's much clearer, is simply... Um, I mean, we have we our search for knowledge. What we can say is provable and touchable, testable knowledge. You know, repeat it as well. It's, and and we need that. We need that for our survival. That's our survival mechanism. Is we've we've just by picking up stones and you know developing uh, uh, the material world around us. Uh, we've this is how we've be, where we're so numerous and how we look for solutions. So that's an incredibly important uh, thing. And and. There's no denying that. Most of our lives are dictated by the inventions. and the, So that's what we could call knowledge. But knowledge at the edge, are beyond the horizon of knowledge, and there always is a horizon. We, don't, we may think we know a lot. We know an astounding amount, but it's still very, very little. You know, when you consider the universe is apparently made up of over 90% black material, black energy, black material, nobody even has the lightest idea what the hell that could be and welcome, which properties that would have. You realise how very, very limited we are. So, I mean, we've come a long way, but in some things we don't... There's always a horizon that we can't see. About. Over that horizon, you have to start to believe. There are only belief systems, and that's why perhaps today people become very religious or whatever. There's a necessity, and, you know, I'm the last person... I think every should, every, this is a human necessity we wouldn't be able to survive without it. So, and I don't, there's no, I don't care what people believe. I mean, I think it's problematic because uh, to some extent, uh, just because the more, the freer a society is, the more rights you have to believe anything you want. Uh, in doing that, you become disparate. You know, we break up into many, many fractions. Uh, it, there's obviously, you don't, in lots of broken up fractions, then you stand, um, in, in difficult position to, to big groups that can somehow find an ortho <laughs> orthodoxy about what they believe, and so you know. And as an artist, in a in a in a single position, yeah, that's the great thing about art is that one, you see the world through the eyes of another individual, and that is something that's, that's I think that's a great privilege. You see the world uh, the way somebody else sees it, and and I think that's something r really quite remarkable. And I think great, and, and finally through art, um, what, you, what you do, so we don't, artists don't do what scientists do, discover it. But I do think that sculpture has become a basic study of the material world, um, and not in the same way scientists. Scientists try to find out the fundamentals and the theories and everything, of how it works. Artists try to find out what the value of that is, what it actually means to us. And I think that's the important job. I mean, all these things, it has to, everything has to be given a language. The, the properties of material have to be given a language. They have to be given a, a role in our thought systems, in our, in our emotional systems. And I think that's the great... It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a such, it's an enormous difference. And I think but the two obviously complement each other. One without the other would, would be disastrous yeah. anyway. So I think they're just two sides of the same coin. Yeah, wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been very patient.
Yes. Thank you. But I think you're just swept away by this continuous flow of wonderful explanations. <laughs> and I think there might be some questions, and there is a mic available for any intervention of yours. Tony Craig sits here. <laughs> I, I have a question because I'm, I'm very taken with the way you talk about all sorts of you know, fundamental profound, uh, questions of sort of work yep. in the history of arts. And uh, one sees that you've been teaching and thinking about these issues. Uh, you know, how you know, Benjamin would say, when you lift the veil, you expose the, sec the secret of the art. And so that's, that's a phenomenon. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Well, then turn on the microphone. <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? Did, did you switch it off? Maybe? Yes, I did. <laughs> Press the wrong button. In that field of emotions. No. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I was quite taken by the way that you address or, or think about uh, canonical aesthetic problems. Uh, you know, when I think about in Benjamin's Valve of Anschaft and also that's the problem of, you know, when you lift the veil, you expose the secret. How to do that without. Uh, Hello? It's Lufthansa. It's on strike. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Not working. I, I just want to say that <laughs> I'm impressed by the way that you address canonical philosophical problems in art. And obviously, it's, it's, all, it's a product of the way you approach your, your art, but also the experience of teaching for so many decades. And I wonder if you could <coughs> talk about if years of teaching with your with some quite extraordinary colleagues in Dusseldorf. Has that mm -hmm. affected your work, the way you talk about your work, the problems that you address, or not, not at all? Um, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I mean, I spoke about the, the Academy in Dusseldorf. I mean, that is, uh, for me, I mean, when I started in the Academy, I worked um, in, in the um, foundation year, it was the first year. And this was great. I was quite young. I was 28, 9 years old. And, uh, and it was I'd been in a foreign country. So it was just great to you know, meet young people. The students were older at that time. And, uh, I, and I was younger. And somehow it was just like having friends. And a lot of these people are my friends today. So when I sort of, and I, I've shared so much I mean, in, uh, with, these, with these artists. I mean, people like Harold Kling and Hurler and. and Wilhelm Wundt and, and the whole people that, that, that grew up in that 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 that, that time, and uh, being in, a, in an academy like Dusseldorf is I'm just simply, I mean I'm I, I don't sit here as the rector of the academy and tell you how wonderful it is, but the academy in Dusseldorf <laughs> is an absolutely remarkable place. I mean, there is no um, there is nothing like it. I mean, no academy has ever produced in 60 years that number of painters, photographers, or sculptors, and uh, and uh, and most of us don't know why, <laughs> why it happened. There are historical reasons for it. But, and it's just great to be in that ambient, you know, and to have, those, have conversations and have a kind of dynamic. But I think more than anything else, I mean, I've, been in, I've, I've, I've worked in a time where so much has happened in art. I mean, I, I wasn't complaining about the, the sort of 60s, you know, where there's a very, very... We used to go to art uh, uh, exhibitions and... Um, more or less, in, Britain, in London, you'd see the same 50 people because that was the art world. And today, you can't, you know, you go to a museum, you can't get in because there's, a, there's an enormous number of queues. And it is, it's difficult because we're living with the art world cultures working through that point now because for a long time, uh, artists wanted to, be, to do their work. They were, even if they, artists have to do the work for themselves. It has to be a personal experience. But on the other hand, there is the hope that this one man position, this one point, this one man view of the world, one woman view of the world, can be shared by others and appreciated by others. And so you want to show the work and whatever. Nowadays, it's an entirely different system. You know, I almost have to protect my students from galleries, museums, media, all the things. I mean, they, 
you know, I mean, the more I'm frustrated by, by students that are continually looking for success solutions and they're not getting on with their work, you know, I mean, because they, 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 they've forgotten to look for what interests them, how to look at something, to analyse it, to interpret it into material and all those things. So, um, but I've experienced, I've, we've, been, we've experienced a time, 40 years, of an enormous kind of cultural revolution worldwide. And look at China or, or Asia generally and in the United States and everywhere else in South America. And so being part of that uh, has, has, it's not just down to talking to colleagues, it's, it's the, big, the big development that's taken place. And I think that has taken us, it's given art a relevance and it has to address the important thing. <coughs> It can't just be, we're not there just to make entertaining, amusing, or things to make a pretty dull world look interesting. You know, I mean, and we're in enormous, I mean, art, sculpture making, I always say, is a very rare production. It's a rare and radical human activity. Most people are making other things. You know, in Berlin, in a day like this, a few hundred million tons of something were made. You know, pizzas, furniture, computers, cars, whatever it is. How many, I'll go to the art school, how many kilograms of sculpture were made today? You know, it's a very small production, but it's a very key and a very important uh, uh, production. Yeah. So I think really art is, uh, you really learn about art by making it. And the conversation, the ambient is, of course, um, is, is important as well. Well, this is <laughs> real. I mean, it's a it's a real it's a real trainee uh, hour here. We learn a lot, but I, I think maybe I can answer a last answer and say this is the big thing. This is the big miracle about art that it shows us to us, the viewers, the public, the people who love art, who need art also, because we feel that in this prefabricated world where we can sit in front of our TV and the only reaction that we have is to switch it on or off. We can say yes or no. There is more possibilities for an individual, for a single human being to understand the world, to try to understand how it works. What are the values embodied in us, these simple human beings who are still the same? We still make our babies the same way as thousands of years ago and to understand what are our individual abilities and possibilities to, to be of importance. And that is what art teaches in a way, what it shows to us. And that's what we in museums, if we are not completely bound to uh, kind of replacing very successful galleries and only showing uh, fat cat artists or so, this is... A, a, a place of education. It is a place of wonderful discoveries for Absolutely. individuals. You can do it on your own. You yeah. don't need teachers. You don't need... You can go. And there it is. The work is done by guys like him and it tells you a story and it tells different stories to different people because whoever comes is of different education, of different ideas and whatsoever. And this is the magic thing. Yeah, In I the works, you need persons maybe, and ideas. Maybe magic, maybe just simply essential. Because we live in a... I mean, if you see the way things are made, they're made simplistically. That's why the utilitarian world, most things are made, by the unevenness of what's made in art and other things. We need all these other things as tools and equipment. I mean, uh, my clothes, the furniture, the room, the house, the street, the city, an enormous material creation our culture, this is our culture, all utilitarian stuff, all done in relatively low, uh, middle, uh, lowest common denominator decision making goes to make most things, economics and, and whatever else. Art gives you a possibility to make things without a utilitarian background. And in you do that, you simply, even if you make a pencil drawing, you know, it's a sort of simple fact, between two points, to add, to just join up two points is an absolutely endless possibility. So you can go the straightest way, and you can take a curve, and you can go one that goes round the moon, and you can go through the whole of the universe. So between two points, there are just infinite number of possibilities. And the minute you put a pencil on a piece of paper, you feel that, pre that fantastic possibility of starting an adventure. You can, the pencil moves on the thing and you don't know where you're going on this journey. 
And that is what, what art, it, it, is, it is a journey and adventure in itself. And it's an essential one. And what it does is it shows you that what we see around us is only the tip of the iceberg. We don't get most of it. We are, we are seeing with certain perceptions and per, certain preconceptions, we see the world around us. But there are many, many other possibilities that, that are yet still hidden from us. Hidden, and that's why that's the mystery that we still are not trying to solve in some ways. There is a contribution. Hi there. Uh, sorry, I just got a question for you. Thank you so much for the, for the beautiful talk. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very um, curious about, uh, I know you mentioned that, that the, uh, the form world really informs what you do, or a lot of it. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, and perhaps you just touched on it a little bit, uh, how much of the, the non-material world or the non-form world, how much of that informs your work? Uh, according to my definition, there isn't one. You, have to, uh, <laughs> you mean brain activity is a material, already a material uh, acti uh, activity as far as I'm concerned. But okay, if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mean, there's a thing called conceptual art. You know, people sit on a chair and sofa and they work out what does the art world need now. And uh, sort of they, they end up making a sort of blah, uh, five, six decisions. The thing is, if you make an artwork, you make a sculpture, you know, if you. Of course, you have some idea about what you want to make, but once you start, after the first 10 minutes and the first dozen decisions, you're already in a territory you hadn't previewed, you know, you hadn't already seen. Now, you can sit on the sofa and start to think about it, and then whatever. And so, sort of, you can't think yourself through art, you know, so that's one thing. So, what you can think about, you can think about certain kinds of content. And I think that's kind of dangerous in a way as well, because I mean, there's a tendency nowadays, I mean, especially with media-driven art, which has, uh, that it ends up sort of with a kind of, has to have some social content, you know, like be nice, you know, women are also human beings and be nice to children and, you know, we're ruining the world. Well, you know, then you can go and watch CNN because it's basically the same message, you know. <laughs> and so, and so you, end up, you end up with a kind of, you, can, you end up with a level which is the media is, is CNN, the message is CNN, you know. Art should be way, way and above that. And that's what most artists do uh, when they actually, they don't, they shouldn't start off with, an, don't start off with a social message because if you just work through the material anyway, it's there. You know, art is political. Art is radically political. You don't have to burden it with some superficial, like a sort of little sugar cover coating of well-meant, uh, um, I don't trust those kind of things, and I trust the material because the material is always there. Thank you. Why not? Any further questions that bring us deeper into that subject? Yes. Or I would say, <laughs> no, I think we, we thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.